Okay, so uh, there are already many questions in Q&A box. So now I'll ask your questions to the speakers. Okay. So firstly, I have a question for Ms. Hattori. Okay. Ms. Hattori, uh, what is the minimum score requirement to apply for Kyoto IAP? Thank you for your question. Uh, we have some requirements to apply for Kyoto IAP, but we don't have uh, any score requirement, no minimum score. So we will conduct the screening considering uh, all your information and documents like uh, academic performance in your high school and English proficiency and uh, some test results. And uh, this is very important, your motivation. Motivation to study, in, especially in this university, and pursue your interest in Japanese language. So please show us all what you have. Yeah, thank you very much. Thank you. Okay, so next uh, for Dr. Tirapon, uh, could you please explain the primary difference between undergraduate school of global engineering and the international course program of civil engineering? Uh, yes, if you visit the website of uh, undergraduate school of global engineering, you see that uh, it consists of three different disciplines, the civil engineering and uh, environmental engineering, and the last one is uh, resources engineering. However, only uh, international course program in civil engineering offers a four-year full English program, while uh, natural uh, resource engineering as well as environmental engineering does not offer uh, English program. So for Kyoto IAP, if you apply for global engineering, if uh, for the first two years you might join ICP, and the two years, another fourth year and third year, you will affiliate to different uh, program, Japanese program of the discipline you choose. Thank you. Okay, thank you very much. Okay, I'll ask Ms. Orbel a uh, question next. So during COVID-19 pandemic, uh, do you take classes online? So if so, uh, please describe what it looks like. Okay, so for the first half of this semester, because Kyoto was placed under a state of emergency due to COVID-19, I did take classes online through Zoom. Uh, but recently, because the, situa the corona situation has gotten better, uh, I have been going to the classroom to take my classes. It's switched to a hybrid style. So the classes are still recorded through Zoom because I have classmates in other countries that still can't enter Japan. But yes, for now I do and go to the classroom. Thank you. Okay, thank you. Good information. Okay, next I have a question for Mr. Yan. After graduation, uh, will you work in Japan or continue your research anywhere? So if you have uh, some uh, career plan, uh, please share it with the audience. Um, thank you very much for the question. And I, I think it's a good question. It's, it's quite difficult to answer at the moment. That um, I cannot give you a very decisive answer, but personally speaking, I'm open to job offers in Japan. And, and because I'm from China, I'm also uh, very considerate about job offers from China. And as for job hunting, I'd like to give you two points. At first is that the training and the research that you have done at Kyoto University is to some state that could guarantee you to find a um, job in the global scientific community. And secondly, I have to say that um, Kyoto University has offered um, many job informations through emails and, and also through the student office that uh, you, you, you don't have to very worry about uh, gathering these informations. And thank you very much. Thank you. Okay, so uh, Dr. Nishino, uh, did you have any uh, questions to, uh, that you would like to share uh, with the audience now, or do you have anything to add about your uh, lecture here? 
Yes, uh, I found only one question that uh, from the sea of questions uh, that I could pinpoint. Uh, it was, uh, can we control human mind using artificial intelligence? I mean, can we program human mind like we program computers and robots? And this is a very interesting question because uh, if you want to control the human mind, you first need to understand how it actually works. And understanding how human intelligence actually works is a very, very hard problem. And um, I'm the department chair of the Department of Intelligence, Science, and Technology. And our department is unique in that we study intelligence not just for artificial intelligence, but also human intelligence. For instance, one of my colleagues, uh, Professor Kamitani, actually uses deep learning methods, deep learning models to try to convert human brain activity read by MRI signals into images. And that's one good example of using AI to actually understand human intelligence. And those two actually go hand in hand. Better AI models get, give us better understandings of human intelligence, and better human un intelligence understandings give us better ideas to apply to AI. So this is a deep question, and uh, that's the direction that we are moving towards, but it'll take much longer. Thank you. OK, thank you very much. Uh, that's interesting. OK, so. Uh, Dr. Kitajima, uh, did you get uh, anything interesting to share with the audience here? Um, let's see. Well, I think, sorry about the little technical difficulty, and I realized when I close my laptop, uh, I will lose some of the list of questions, but thanks to Professor Nishino, there is one question that I might address. It came from an Indonesian student. The forest in Indonesia, do they have relevance for a global climate change and global issues? The answer is yes. But in the field of ecology, we use the word, um, you know, it, it's a saying, think globally and act locally. But also what you do in terms of your, you know, forest in your surrounding area, behind your village, behind the cultivated land, these things directly have relevance to what happens to your livelihood and economy too. So we really need to have balance of different spatial skills and uh, I'd like all of you to think about the issues, not just to your future, what college you're going to go, how much money you're going to make. Yes, we have to make these goals too, but I'd like all of you to think about bigger picture to work together. Thank you very much. Okay, thank you very much. So uh, we still have many questions, but th this would be the last one. So uh, Ms. Orbel, uh, does the scholarships cover all your expense? Okay, to clarify this, IOP scholarship covers the tuition, so I don't pay any tuition. And it also gives me 120,000 yen uh, scholarship. And that 120,000 yen, 120, yen scholarship, I use that to pay the rent. I use that to buy my food, my some clothes, some other stuff, uh, entertainment, etc. So yes, I would say that the scholarship covers all my expenses. Okay. Thank you. Uh, thank you for your good information to the audience. So thank you very much, all the speakers here. Uh, we still have many questions in the Q&A box, but unfortunately, it's time to finish the session. So if you have any further questions, you can visit and use the inquiry form or contact by email. FAQ and other application information are also on our website, so please visit them.